गणेशाय नम सरस्वत नम श्रीगुरभ्यो नम हरि वो ये कदंताय विमे वक्रतुंडा धीमह तो दि प्रचोदया ओम श्री साई राम लविंग प्रणाम्स एट द लोटस फीट ऑफ अब मोस्ट बिलवर्ड लॉर्ड भगवान श्री सत्य साई बाबा Are you very upset? It is indeed a matter of great blessing and privilege for me to once again invite all of you to this divine satsang being organized by Sri Satya Sai Samyukta Suti Shreeni. under sri satyasai seva organization today for this divine satsang we have with us yet another devout pious and humble soul professor v chandrasekhar to address us for this 25th episode under the gama agama lecture series under the title vedas the very foundation of indian culture and spirituality today professor dr chandrasekhar will be addressing on the relevance of shrimad bhagavad gita to the modern society few words about this great personality professor dr v chandrasekhar professor v chandrasekhar is the director and distinguished professor at tfr hyderabad is also a professor of chemistry at iit kanpur he got his phd from the indian institute of science bengaluru and his postdoc from the university of massachusetts united states earlier he was the head of the department of chemistry at iit kanpur dean of faculty affairs iit kanpur dean at ta for hyderabad director for nicer bhuvaneshwar and recently he was the vice president of insa he specializes in organometallic chemistry inorganic chemistry and molecular materials he has guided several phd's and several publications are to his credit he got the shanti swarup bhatnagar award in the year 2003 he is the fellow of all the three national academies he is also the fellow of world academy of science he has also won several awards to his credit like insa gold medal shastra cnr award nasi award and many such distinguished awards to his credit 
his association with Satisai Seva organization goes as follows. Since 1992, the time at which he for the first time visited Prashanti Nilayam and received divine blessings to continuously visit the abode of divine peace, Prashanti Nilayam, every year. As a member of DST PACT meeting, which was held in the Satisai Institute of Higher Learning, Prashant Liam, he was blessed along with his colleagues by an interview and personal meeting with our dear Lord, by our dear Lord Bhagwan Baba. Since 2000, he has been a regular visitor to Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning as a visiting professor and gave series of courses to the students almost every year during summers. He was one of the very active members of Sri Satisai Seva organization at IIT Kanpur. He was also the convener for the Satisai Seva organization summit at IIT Kanpur for several years and spearheaded the spiritual, educational and service activities of the center. It is indeed a matter of great honor for all of us to hear from such an accomplished person about his learnings on Srimad Bhagavad Gita and its relevance to the modern society. With prayers to Bhagavan, and now I request Professor V. Chandrasekhar to take over. Sai Ram. Gum Havamahe, Kavin Kavina Mukavashravastam Jeshtarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Pataana Shunvan Nuti Visi the Sadanam. Hello, thank you. Om Ganana Antwa Ganapatigum Havamahe, Kavin Kavina Mukavashravastam. Jeshtarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Padaana Shrunvan Nuti Visi Dasadanam Prano Devi Saraswati Vaje Virvajini Vati Dhinama Vitrayavatu Ganesha Yanamaha Saraswati Namaha Shri Guru Pyon Namaha Hari Om Om Saishwaraya Vidmahe Satya Deva Yadhi Mahi Tanna Sarva Prachodaya At Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Deva Yadhi Mahi Tanna Sarva Prachodaya At 
साईश्वराय विमे सत्यदेवाय धीमह तर्व प्रचोदया ओम श्री साईराम टुडेज लेक्चर ऑन दिस गामा अगमा लेक्चर सीरीज विल बी ऑन आस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ भगवदगीता इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट्स डिस्कशन particularly of its relevance to modern society is it a uh, useful today this ancient text which uh, probably 5000 years ago a lord krishna uh, gave it as a sermon to arjuna in the middle of a battlefield what's the relevance of this text today in the modern society as we are in the 21st century does it have any uh, meaning for today's world so that will be the part of discussion today and since this is a part of the gama agama lecture series what is the relevance of bhagavad gita to vedas but before i do that i want to uh, pray at swami's lotus feet and dedicate this at to swami and uh, request his guidance uh, during this talk so before we start our discussion let's have a brief uh introduction to what we practice as sanatana dharma you know in fact the word hinduism is probably a misnomer sanatana dharma is what majority of us practice or majority of us belong to and this sanatana dharma unlike other religions that are there in the world does not have one single text for example if you take uh, the religions in the world like christianity uh, they have the bible and you have the old testament and the new testament and that is the only book really which gives them all the codes uh, the ethics and also uh, the religious um, uh, uh, in terms of the religious sermons or the religious precepts are given in this book similarly the jews have the tanakh uh, which contains the torah and there is their religion book and islam has the holy quran buddhism the tripitaka sikhism has a guru granth sahib jainism has the jain agamas and um, the zoroastrianism has the zendavasta so what about hinduism what is our religious text is there one single religious text is it the ramayanam is it the bhagavatam what is our text what is our text which tells us about what are the practices that we need to do so if you look at uh, sanatana dharma unlike uh, other religions we don't have a single text we have broadly what are called as a shruti that is what has been heard people haven't written them down by their own imagination or intelligence but this is something that stuck to them while they were meditating and uh, uh, this is one one text of our sanatana dharma then there is smruti which are author, authored by humans and there are number of smrutis uh, that are that have been done which um, allow us help us in terms of our conduct and because these are pretty complicated um, bhagwan veda vyasa decided that he will write the morals of these texts in the form of stories in the form of puranas and there are 18 of them and in addition he also wrote bhagavatam which is related to the glories of the god there also we have this itihasas ramayanam and mahabharatam which also contain the in addition to the religious aspects the ethical and the moral aspects uh, that need to be practiced that have been uh, coming to us from ages immemorial now among these of relevance to us are the shruti because this lecture series is under the relevance of vedas uh, to the modern society and of course we have the vedas have been divided by vyasa into four rig sama yajur and atharva and all of these contain the following things they contain the samhitas which contain benedictions or mantras or prayers and there are certain rituals and observances 
to be practiced which come under um, aranyakas these are also part of uh, uh, the vedas and then there are brahmanas uh, this is their commentaries that is say uh, for example if uh, what is uh, written or given in the vedas is cryptic then there is a commentary which expands on what has been told and finally the distilled information in terms of philosophical uh, dialogues or philosophical perspectives are given in the upanishads so these upanishads in fact are um, uh, the ones when we talk about vedanta these are the upan these are uh, the texts that really contain the various thought processes that are distilled codified in these upanishads there are several of them there are uh, about 108 of them and uh, some of the famous ones are listed over here the bruhadaranyaka upanishad the chandogya upanishad taitri upanishad uh, kena upanishad katha upanishad isha upanishad and so on now these uh, they are um, very rich texts and uh, very deep and uh, they can't be you know they are not easy reading they require uh, a considerable amount of effort um, perhaps people who have read them and understood them and have written commentaries on them uh, and still they are not so easy to understand the essence of these uh, and what they contain but they are very interesting in that they are really uh, um, uh, in in many cases they are conversations the conversations between a teacher and a student sometimes between husband and wife um and for example in the case of the katha upanishad it is between uh, a young person nachiketa and a god yama in every case there is somebody who knows the truth and somebody who is interested in knowing the truth so what is the truth so according to uh, sanatana dharma and as uh, swami um, illustrates truth is something that does not change uh, in all times Uh, so we have for example uh, what we see today uh, our bodies themselves have continuous change uh, the world is continuously changing the universe is continuously changing so according to sanatana dharma there is a truth which is completely unchanging which is eternal so uh, people who are interested in knowing this truth this quest uh, ask these questions who am i and there are other questions that follow where did i come from why am i here what's the goal of life where am i going and so on so the upanishads try to answer these questions in a logical manner and this constitutes in, indeed the philosophy the indian philosophy uh, belonging to the sanatana and in fact uh, the four mahavakyas that are the distil the distillate essence of these upanishads are really uh, these four pragnanam brahma that means what is god the ultimate god brahman so one of the statements in the aitri upanishad and rigveda says that consciousness is god consciousness is brahma pragnanam brahma in manduki upanishad again in atharva veda it says i am atma brahma the atma is brahma there is no distinction between atma and brahman and then in chandogya upanishad which comes in the samaveda there is this mahavakya tatvam asi that that is something so when you say that it means that brahman that you are you are nothing but that that is the chandogya upanishad and finally uh, in bruhadaranyaka upanishad in yajurveda aham brahma asmi i am brahman so you when you come to this realization i am brahman of course then you met the uh, goal of your life the summit of uh, your endeavors now with this background in what way is bhagavad gita related to the vedas and is it something different so essentially all the commentaries of bhagavad gita tell us that bhagavad gita contains the essence of upanishadic knowledge in addition it also tells us how to live in this world which is changing and how to have a goal which is much higher than the normal worldly goals and how to attain moksha or liberation of freedom from the cycle of life and birth 
and it gives four paths to this that you can use these four paths to ultimately achieve this goal karma yoga jnana yoga raja yoga bhakti yoga so these yogas are prescribed in the gita in different the gita contains 18 chapters and these chapters contain um, you know these different pathways and in fact swami says uh, that gita is the milk of the upanishads and why is it uh, necessary uh, for this milk to be given because it it actually has been drawn by the cowherd krishna with the help of arjuna because of arjuna's questions uh, krishna has drawn this gita uh, which is the milk of the upanishads uh, the reason this has been drawn is because of all the dalbited people like us so that we can drink and draw sustenance from because uh, the upanishads themselves are um, quite difficult for most of us in terms of understanding them in, in terms of understanding uh, what they really contain because they are abstract and uh, difficult to follow so we have therefore a summary of the upanishads in the form of bhagavad gita and bhagwan comments in gita vahini uh, that gita is the quintessence of all the vedas so whatever you need to learn from the vedic upanishads particularly the uh, bhagavad gita contains it it is with this sort of context that we will look at uh, bhagavad gita today in terms of its relevance to the modern world so let's look at bhagavad gita first let's look at the context so where was this uh, taught it was not taught in a the calm of a you know a, a, a peaceful place it on uh, like in a nor was it taught in a conference related to philosophy it was taught in the middle of a battlefield with, with so much of din and uh, when people were about to indulge in a battle the setting was in that particular place in the middle of the battlefield it's a dialogue between arjuna and shri krishna arjuna asks some questions and krishna elaborates on those questions and uh, gives answers to them but apart from these two nobody in the battlefield heard it but outside the battlefield vyasa sanjaya and dhrutarashtra have heard it but even among these people only vyasa and sanjaya could actually imbibe the essence of this apart from arjuna of course but it is not just meant for these people it is meant for all of humanity because it is relevant 5000 years ago it is relevant today it tells us how to live and it tells us how we can achieve the ultimate aim of human life and it's contained in 700 shlokas and it comes in the bhishma parva of mahabharata and it begins with the word dharma and ends with the word mama so it is about mama dharma our dharma what should we do what should we do depends upon who we are and what is our dharma so this is a setting the setting is not as i said not in some peaceful conference hall where there's a conference going on philosophy and uh, there was this gita enunciated as a indian philosophy it is in the middle of battle so similarly in the battle of life is gita relevant and the answer of course without um, i mean without reading all the 18 chapters is a resounding yes so the question all of us know the questions um, it actually began when the war was about to begin and arjuna wanted uh, to have a look at uh, the armies that are arrayed against him and uh, his side the pandavas so he requested krishna can you please take me to the middle of this the battlefield so you know it is in, in those days even the battles would start on time One, until the signal is given the battle won't start so the battle had not yet started uh, it was, there was uh, there was time for it people were ready but the time for the battle had not yet been uh, uh, given there's no uh, you know the alarm for it had not gone off yet so arjuna requested krishna uh, to take him to the middle so he wanted to have a look at who are these people who are arrayed against us because he knew that they were fighting for the right things so clearly those who are fighting against them were people who did not uh, believe in the right things but when he saw the people who were in front of him arjuna became extremely weak because who did he see there he saw bhishma he saw drona he saw all his relatives and he suddenly felt extremely weak and he says 
how can i fight i just don't have any will to fight because i can't fight and kill my relatives my friends my gurus if i win this battle after this fight is the battle really worth winning won't i incur humongous sins if i commit to this bloody battle is it not better for me to quit this battle and lead the life of an ascetic so what if i don't get the kingdom but i at least won't be committing this sin so this was arjuna's after he felt this revulsion against the war this was his rationalization that he was thinking that his thinking was right that he was doing the pious thing by thinking that he doesn't want to fight because that he will commit this uh, terrible sin by committing to this bloody battle and by killing his relatives by killing his friends and killing his gurus and he says nakankshe vijayam krishna nacharajyam sukhani cha kim no rajyena govinda kim bhogay jivite nava so he says i don't desire victory krishna i don't desire kingdom i don't desire pleasures what's the use of all of this if i kill all of these people who are so dear to me so near to me oh krishna even life itself is not useful to me if i uh, indulge in this bloody battle so this is not just arjuna's question we are most of us in fact all of us are plagued with this question it is not necessary about a war that we have to fight but it's about a question that plagues us in situations where we are not able to we are not sure what is right and what is wrong and we think that if i do something which appears to be right maybe there are several uh several things that fall out as a result of this action which might not be the correct one so should we go ahead with this particular action and it's a mental battle for us many times when we face this we may face it internally so this question is not just arjuna's question in fact it's a question that plagues all the world and we have to find the right answer and krishna before giving the answer first says you know just get up and fight don't do this useless talk you are come to this war knowing all the circumstances knowing all you have already deliberated and debated about it enough and after all of that you have come here to fight so now don't cry and say what's the point of fighting so in two very powerful messages which are very relevant to modern india to all of us krishna says don't just keep whining fight and do your job so krishna says kutastva kashpala vidam vishame samupasthitam anarya jushtam aswargyam akirta karam arjuna He says what is this what happened to you arjuna this is this kind of dejection and this dejection is disgraceful it is anaryan like it's not you know it's not befitting the famous family in which you are born and it is heaven excluding so what what kind of this is this and then he says klaibyam masmagama partha naitattava upapadhyate shudram hrudaya daurbalyam chaktvo tishta parantapa The, what you are feeling is not a sense of pity it's a sense of impotence don't yield to this impotence it doesn't befit you it is a weakness your knees are shaking your hands are shaking not because you think that the, not because it's a it's a piety not because it's a good thing but because you are caught up with the wrong questions and this is weakness of heart stand up o parantapa and fight so before krishna tells anything he first tells pretty harshly to arjuna fight get up and fight do all this philosophical talking later first you are here in the middle of the battle your job is to fight job and do that fight now these are really powerful messages not just for arjuna for all of us because most of us when we are in endeavor sometimes slightly we have we have embarked on an endeavor we knew that it was uh, somewhat difficult and we will encounter difficulties but we give up very easily and we say that oh because of this i could not do it or because of something else i could not do it so we blame everybody else except ourselves for our failures or for our lack of will or lack of resolve so krishna says don't worry about anything having come to this particular point 
your job is now just to do what you're supposed to do, namely fight, and then worry about the results later. Arjuna, of course, um, goes further forward. He goes back and forth. But finally, once he realizes that he's in the state where he is not able to come to an answer, he has to now find an answer from a higher power than him. So he surrenders. He surrenders to God and prays for help. And when you pray sincerely and surrender to God, answers will come, even for the most difficult questions. As Swami says, whenever you have the situation, go to a place of your worship and think about me. An answer will come in some form or other. And Arjuna surrenders to God and then he prays. So he says, please instruct me what to do because I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Therefore, I'm fully surrendering to you. Please instruct me. So he says, Karpanya doshopa hatasvabhava pruchamitvam dharma sammoda cheta yachreya syan nishchitam druhitanme sishyas teham sadhimam tva prapannam. So Arjuna so far looked at Krishna as a friend, as a relative, somebody whom he can get along very well. But he now realizes that Krishna is the one who can guide him. So he says, my heart is overpowered with the taint of pity. I'm just not able to do anything. I'm not able to resolve whether this is right or whether this is wrong. And therefore, I'm not able to take an action. And because of this, my mind is confused as to what my duty is. Should I run away from the war, which will avoid the bloodshed? But that would be something that is perhaps not the correct thing to do. But if I fight the war, clearly a lot of people will die. Is that the right thing? So I ask thee, tell me decisively what is good for me. I am thy disciple. Instruct me who has taken refuge in thee. So when you completely surrender to God and request his help, help will be coming and help. It, it was Arjuna's good fortune that uh, he uh, was compelled to surrender here. And then Krishna's words followed, which allowed him to um, get clarity on the situation. So the first thing, what Krishna does is, uh, since Arjuna was worried that he was going to kill people, people who are dear to him, like Bhishma and Drona, and many others in the Kaurava family, first Krishna puts the highest philosophy first, up front. He tells him about the highest philosophy and tells him, don't get worried. Nobody dies. Now, nobody dies. We all are eternal. So what dies is the body, but the indweller of this body doesn't die. So there are several shlokas, beautiful uh, shlokas that are there. I just chosen two of them to illustrate this. So Krishna says, Dehinos minyatha dehe kaumaram yavanam jara Tatha dehantara prapti dhiras tatra na mukhyati. So he says, you know, just as you know, you, you wear a shirt and the shirt gets dirty and then you wash it, you wear it again. And then after some time, this cloth uh, is just worn out. And then what do you do? You don't cry about it, you just throw it and then you wear another shirt. Similarly, this body, which your soul or the embodied soul, which, which, which is embodied by the soul, uh, the soul just wears this body and then this body first has a childhood, then has the youth, the middle age, the old age. And then finally, when the body is untenable for the soul, the soul just discards the body and then goes off into another body. The person who knows it does not grieve about it. He takes it as naturally as discarding an old cloth. So Krishna elaborates on this. Vasam si jirnani yatha vihaya. Navani Gruhyati Naru Parani, Tatha Sharirani Vihaya Jirna, Nyun Nyanyani Samyati Navani Dehi. So just as a man casts off his own clothes and puts on new clothes, so does the embodied soul. The self casts off its worn out bodies and enters others which are new. So of course, the whole trick is to see that you don't enter into another body. The self should realize and therefore you are out of this cycle. Otherwise, this is the cycle that continues. You die and then you get into another body and this continues. So Krishna says, firstly, don't grieve. Don't, you're not killing anybody. You're just killing the body and then it goes off. 
and then the soul is completely eternal there is absolutely nothing that you can do to the soul neither your uh, arrows can pierce it nor your um, uh, knife can uh, do anything to it nor water can uh, you know uh, water or air or uh, any of these elements can do anything to it so don't get worried about that then of course what about the pain and the grief you know when i have a headache i do feel pain when uh, somebody dear to me passes away or when something happens i do have grief or when something happens i eat uh, something that is pleasant i have the pleasure what about these things then krishna says yes of course they are there so we have these senses and these senses which that if we for example i touch something that is hot i will feel the heat i touch something that is cold then i feel the cold similarly if i eat something which is uh, pleasurable i feel the pleasure or i feel the pain so he says these have a beginning and an end so matra sparshastu kaunteya sitoshna sukha dukkhada agamapayino nityastam sthiti kshasva bharata so he says you know this is natural for the body to have because your body has the senses and when the senses are in contact with objects they will have this uh, they whether they are heat they are cold pleasure pain but these have a beginning and these have an end if you for example eat an ice cream you feel good at that particular point of time if you like ice creams but that pleasure comes to an end similarly you have a pain that pain comes to an end so they have a beginning and they have an end they are impermanent so what's our what should we do we have to endure them this is what krishna says there nothing you can do you have to endure them bravely and think that this too will pass if it's a pain you can say it uh, tell yourself that this too will pass whatever tough times i'm having it will not last long it will pass and if i'm having a pleasure this we even though we don't acknowledge it it is not permanent so as swami says pleasure is an interval between two pains or if you want to think about the other way around pain is an interval between two pleasures so with this krishna then after he tells about this highest uh, philosophy that uh, you know don't worry we are all permanent the souls are all permanent we there is nothing left we, uh, um, uh, there nothing is created nor nothing is destroyed the self is permanent the body is the impermanent after having uh, told this to krishna uh, to arjuna krishna now tells on how do we perform actions because we are in this world and we have to perform actions and of course the uh, the, the net uh, sort of uh, the summary of this entire thing is without attachment to the results you perform the actions because you have to act and krishna tells that i who have created this world and uh, who is a supreme godhead i don't have to do anything but i am constantly performing action not that i have to perform action for a result but i have to perform action for the action say so we have to perform action because we are stationed in life and when we are stationed in life with particular duties those have to be completed those have to be performed so we have to perform actions without attachment to the result but this might look contradictory but uh, as we will go through the next uh, couple of shlokas and try to look at it uh, in fact there is nothing contradictory your best actions can only be obtained only when you don't have attachment to the results so this is of course the most famous shloka that uh, everyone would know karmanye vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phala hetur bhu e sankhostva karmani it might look little contradictory but because what it says is you are you 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 have only the right to work but not its fruits therefore let not the fruits of action be your motive and the attachment um, and let not the attachment to be for inaction that means because you're not having uh, the action results don't be uh, don't be attached to inaction so what does it mean does it mean that i should not uh, you know uh, because each one of us we do something because we want something but krishna says no you should do the work but without worrying about what you get and after we go through the next shloka we will we'll, we'll elaborate on this little more the next shloka which is follows this very famous shloka says yogastha kuru karmani 
संगम त्यक्वा धनंजय सिद्ध सिद्ध्यो समो भूत्वा समत्वम योग उच्चते दट इज यू परफॉर्म एक्शन बट बीइंग स्टेडफास्ट इन योगा सो व्हेन यू आर डूइंग दिस एक्शन यू डोंट हैव एनी डोंट हैव एनी अटैचमेंट एंड यू बी बैलेंस्ड इफ यू गेट सक्सेस एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ दैट एक्शन डोंट बी ओवरजॉयड इफ यू हैव फेलियर डोंट गेट डिप्रेस्ड एंड सच एन इवननेस ऑफ माइंड इज कॉल्ड योगा and therefore that is karma yoga according to krishna so uh, this is this can be elaborated so me in several of his speeches he has elaborated this so what he says so as is so you work but the result of your work doesn't depend on your work alone it depends also on external factors so you have done something and there is some additional external factor non controllable by you and your work plus this external factor gives the result and therefore your what you are working alone doesn't give you the result this external factor also is involved in it that is not in your control so what is in your control is your capability to perform the action so you perform that action as efficiently as you can and don't worry about the external factors leave that to god leave that to somebody whom you have the faith that will deliver as a result of your work also what it means is if you work today let us say and you a result will come in a future date so essentially therefore you are not happy today you are postponing your happiness because you haven't got the result so you have worked hard today but your result is going to come sometime later you should be very happy that you have performed very efficiently today but since the The result of that action is going to come sometime later instead of being happy you feel uncertain that what will be the result of this and therefore your current happiness is deprived from you therefore you will have to if you are working for the result then you will have to wait to get the result and depending on the result your happiness is going to be uh, determined if, but on the other hand if your happiness depends on your work then you don't have to worry about a future date you're just working uh, and your happiness results from the work that you carried out even from a very practical sense so for example let's say that there's a surgeon who's performing a surgery a surgeon can let and let us say that there's a surgery he has to perform on somebody he is uh, he doesn't know he can the the, the surgeon can perform the surgery to the utmost capability because Uh, the ultimate result of this surgery whether it's a failure or a success doesn't impact him directly i mean it does impact him as a surgeon he might feel bad doesn't impact him directly but supposing imagine that say his uh, kitokin is on the surgery table and he has to perform the surgery that fact that the person is the kitokin and he has to perform the surgery he is worried about the result what happens if it's a failure so he's worried about it because it impacts him directly if that worry was not there the action would be far more efficient so even from a very practical sense therefore karma yoga which says that do your work and don't get worried about what happens your job is to do the work if you're a student your job is to study to the best of your capability and perform to the best of your capability don't worry about what happens then if you're worried about what happens then your current uh capability of performing the work efficiently gets um really impacted so this is a tremendous amount of relevance in current days world because uh i mean almost everybody uh is so obsessed in terms of what will happen to them what will happen if i don't get that or this and and so on and therefore that impacts their current happiness uh, and more than probably in any other age today we find so many younger children younger people um are depressed because they don't know uh, what will be the result of their actions whether they'll have a future good life or not they are worried about everything and that worry leads to improper performance of action currently therefore uh, this message of karma yoga really is more relevant today than at any point of time in the history of human kind so there are two things which are um, which also are relevant over here and which bhagwan many times has uh, addressed in his speeches and uh, comes across in other uh, indian texts also they called shreyas and prayas so there are two actions 
So when we are at crossroads, most often there are two actions that kind of beckon us uh, to take us one path or the other path. One path is Shreyas, the other path is Prayas. So here Arjuna also has got the two situations. One was, uh, you know, to just run away and uh, not get involved in the bloodshed. It appears to be the simpler path. Just run away. You're uh, totally uh, away from this bloodshed that's happening and you don't have to take responsibility for, for it. And you are somewhere peace, peaceful in a cave and you don't know what's happening. So this particular path, uh, which is prayers, is a path that is pleasant immediately, but its long term impact is terrible. The Shreyas, on the other hand, is something that is difficult. It's a difficult path. It's a difficult path. It requires a lot of effort to do the path. Imagine, for example, you have to get up every day at 4.30 and do meditation or do yoga or to do exercise. It is not easy. It's much more preferable. You feel, you feel I would like to, you know, if the alarm goes off at whatever time you put on at 5.30, 6 o'clock or 4.30, your first instinct would be to uh, shut off that alarm and sleep for another half an hour. Because that is a pleasant thing. That is prayers. But on the other hand, getting up at that particular time and doing that good thing, it could be an exercise, it could be meditation, it could be whatever, is a difficult thing, but it's long-term good that it does to you is enormous. So Bhagavad Gita at all points of time tells us that be intelligent, discriminate between Shreyas and Prayas and pick up Shreyas over Prayas. So this is this particular shloka is from the Kathopanishad. Uh, again, you can, you can see that the Bhagavad Gita is really very much uh, in terms of an essence of the Upanishads. So it says, Shreyascha Prayascha Manushya Metas. This is actually told by Yama to Nachiketa. Um, Shreyascha Prayascha Manushya Metas Tatao uh, Samparitya Vivinakti Dhiraha Shreyohi Dhirohi Prayaso Vrnitite Preyo mando yoga yoga kasho ma 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 the So it says that the excellent and the pleasant. So there is excellent, which is shreyas, and there is pleasant. The pleasant is the one that is uh, easy for us to pick up, but this is always present to every human being at every walk of life. But a real thoughtful mind distinguishes, discriminates between choosing amongst them. And even though it is difficult, the wise always choose the good over the pleasant. So then you have this choice, ask yourself whether it is the excellent or it's a pleasant, whether it's a shreyas or it's a prayas, and pick up the shreyas over the prayas. Okay. That will help you to reach the goal because that's a long in the long term that's a good the prayers is always good in the beginning but it leads to long term difficulties the other aspect which bhagavad gita uh, krishna teaches uh, arjuna because arjuna tells arjuna asks him a question and although a little later but the answer is already given before that you know why do people who know what is good and what is bad seem to still doing bad. That is, they, they know perfectly why one is good, one is bad. But nevertheless, they seem to be picking up the bad over the good, the wrong path over the right path. So Krishna tells in a, a series of shlokas that it's like, you know, there is a like a, um, you're just falling down uh, and there is a, there is a, one, one thing leads to the other and then you're in a slide. And the slide leads you to your downfall. So very beautifully, in a very uh, sort of a po poetic and sort of dramatic manner, he explains how this happens. Dhyayato vishayan tumsaha sangaste shupajayate sangat sanjayate kamaha kamat krodho vijayate. So Krishna says when people get obsessed with objects, I mean, just not things, but obsessed with objects. I want this. And this I want this uh, leads to not just a passing I want, but I want it very badly. I want it so badly that I don't care whatever are the uh, consequences of obtaining it. So you, you, you are kind of having, you think about them, then you're getting attached to them. And this attachment leads to an intense desire. And if this desire is not fulfilled, then you have anger. 
you get anger and this anger then leads to actions which are not under your control so you you are thinking about an object your senses are looking at an object and that leads to attachment and attachment leads to a desire that is you want that particular thing and if you are not able to get that thing then anger arises so in its extremity it can lead to your downfall so what happens if you get anger krodhat bhavati sammoha when your anger becomes um, uncontrollable then your capability to think completely is lost krodhat bhavati sammoha sammoha smruti vibhramah smruti bhramshat buddhi nasho buddhi nashat pranashyati so beautifully um, it's a it's a wonderful illustration of what happens if you have this uh, a series of events so you have anger and as anger becomes uncontrollable then you just get deluded you lose you lose the uh, process of uh, which which tells you that if you go to a certain action what can happen um and that is basically uh, you are unable to now discriminate that is you are acting without the capability to act because you are acting now under delusion and from um, uh, in in a manner that uh, is completely indiscriminate and therefore an action that could lead to destruction so uh, from anger comes delusion and from delusion you have a loss of memory because you're not able to think about what would be the uh, what even for example if you have to relate to the action you're doing and to something that might have happened in history you're not able to relate to that because you are so angry and so delusional about your own capability is perhaps uh, which can uh, uh, get that that because you want to fulfill that objective which is the de- that intense desire of getting that object and that leads to um, not rationally thinking and therefore there is a disruption there is a destruction or discrimination and from that you have destruction and this is so relevant in the current world today we see this all across and we have this wars and these wars are essentially the result of the ego of a few people or of or of society and that ego uh, leads to this um, all of this that happens finally leading to destruction so you can see the relevance of bhagavad gita teachings uh, to all of us uh, to to society leaders to political leaders and to every single person um, in this world today but on the other hand if you are if you understand this and therefore you have you have seen the object your senses are in touch with the object but you know what it is therefore you are you are you have the capability to restrain your senses and you you tell your senses that this is not correct this is that this is right this is wrong this is shreyas this is prayas and then you can attain peace so raga dvesha vyuktaistu vishayan indriya ischaran atma vashyair vidheyatma prasadam adikhachyati but the self control man the person who does not fall under the trap he can move in the objects because he is he is free from attraction and repulsion because he has got this capability to discriminate he is not attached to the objects and therefore his he has this capability and therefore he can attain peace therefore uh, uh, krishna concludes that o oh arjuna that person's knowledge is steady who senses are restrained from sense objects that means you can see the sense object for example if your senses are in touch with the sense objects not that you take them to some way place some other place but you see them but you you your your mind is in full control of the sense objects tasmad yasya mahabaho nigruhitani sarvasha indriyani indriyarthe abhyastasya prajna pratishtita so even though uh, the person who has no control of the senses and who has the control of the senses both of them have the objects in front of them the difference is the person who sees the sense objects but who has got a steady mind is where her senses are completely restrained because uh, this this mind is in full control can tell it's like this charioteer where you have this uh, the 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 horses which can run berserk but this horses won't run berserk 
if there is a steady charioteer who can put them under control so bhagwan beautifully says um, in his speeches in this divine discourse uh, january 13 1965 bhagwan says the seer the person who is seeing you are seeing the objects the seer should not attach oneself to the scene that is the secret to break free how can you break free or how can you even do work efficiently so bhagwan says the contact of senses with objects arouses desire and attachment this leads to effort and if you are obtaining the object you get elation if you don't you get despair so either elation or despair then there is fear of loss or grief at failure and the train of reaction lengthens with many doors and windows kept open to all the windows that blow how can the windows of supposing you have a steady lamp that is there in that room but you keep all the doors open and the winds are blowing can this flame survive similarly your mind the lamp that lamp is the mind which must burn steadily unaffected by the demands by the jewel demands of the world outside complete surrender to the lord is one way of closing the windows and doors for then in that attitude of complete surrender to god sharanagati you are bereft of ego and so you are not buffeted by joy or grief complete surrender makes you draw upon the grace of the lord for meeting all the crises in your life and so it renders you heroic well prepared for the challenges of life so swami in all his discourses first exhorts you to do karma yoga not attached to the work but tells that the secret of success is in surrendering surrendering to god sharanagati by surrendering all your actions to god so swami says in a very beautiful manner that every day morning when you get up for work you pray to swami that all the work that i am carrying out today swami i am surrendering to you and every day and night when you retire to bed tell yourself swami all the work that i have done today i am surrendering to you then you don't have to and of course initially this may be from your lips but eventually if it's from your heart and you are really surrendering everything to swami then no action that you perform will be attached to you and therefore you'll be untainted with that action so similarly another time a discourse on um, 1964 swami says a millionaire pays income tax with tears in the eyes although he has millions but still uh, when he pays tax to the government uh, this person has years and tears in the eyes but on the other hand let us say there is a headmaster and he is transferred he joyfully gives up all the furniture and the laboratory appliances of his school when transferred to another location why because the headmaster knows that he is only the caretaker he is not the owner he is not attached to these articles he knows that they belong to the government so when a new person comes he just has absolutely no problem so to swami says feel that your family your house your fields your car all are the lord's property and you are only the trustee be ready to give them up without a murmur at a moment's notice you must give up your pursuit of sensory objects if you seek lasting peace and joy material wealth brings along with it not only joy but also grief accumulation of riches multiplication of wants these lead only to alternation between joy and grief and swami says what is what we have just seen in bhagavad gita attachment is the root of both joy and grief detachment is a savior attachment asakti is death non attachment anashakti is like a savior so uh, this was a uh, this of course swami has said in several discourses but this one is from his divine discourse in august 19th in 1964 so the summary of what we have seen so far when we are supposed to do work don't whine don't rationalize about why we should not do the work don't run away don't whine work don't run away do your duty and our philosophy the sanatana dharma the vedas and its essence the upanishads tell us that we are not the body mind and intellect we are the self which is indestructible and eternal and the purpose of our life is to realize the self the question is how so swami tells in bhagavad gita 
that karma yoga at work carried out without attachment to the work purifies the mind and with such a purified mind we develop love for god which is upasana and with such a purified mind with the love for god we acquire knowledge about ourselves and when this happens automatically there is renunciation or sacrifice and in that meditation process that follows one realizes itself even if you are in the very beginning at the karma yoga stage uh, in the in the work stage uh, if we can get to the stage of a karma yoga that itself is a major accomplishment so what should be the short term goals therefore i mean the long term goal somebody who is ready for this is probably at the uh, end of the last thing but the short term goal is work without being obsessed with the result means without getting worried about so every time when we start working even when we begin let's not get worried about what the result will be work and then results will follow so this is like you are working surrendering the work to god and let the results of the work descend on us like prashad like grace of god and therefore selfless work is the best form of work uh, where we are not at least we are not uh, consistently and consciously worried only about the result second live and enjoy in the present because when we are working today let's be happy about the work we have carried out today this if you are worried about the result we are postponing our happiness to the time when we get the result if the result is good we are happy if the result is bad we are unhappy but if you are only worried about the work we are doing then we are happy because we are always living in the present third control your senses not by suppression but by sublimation so swami has a very beautiful example let's say if we have let us we have this uh, uh, terrible qualities that would be there like uh, you know moha uh, mada matsarya and so on um, so if uh, if you want to control them how do we do this how can we get rid of them so swami says you can do it by don't don't if you suppress them they'll come back again like the weeds but you sublimate them so for example if i have if you are angry uh, then maybe you should be angry that my um, i'm not doing enough work i'm not doing enough good work and be angry at yourself for that uh, if you are jealous of somebody else maybe you should be jealous that you haven't reached your goals of being near to swami yet so have a higher goal so put your senses to work for a higher goal and that way you are subliming your senses you're not suppressing your senses and finally as swami said many times have a ceiling on your desires don't continue because if you are if you have fulfilled one desire and uh, you have a train of desires to follow then that would lead to what you have seen earlier there are these um, unattainable desires lead to the slide of downfall so have a ceiling of desires which should be a disciplined way of life and so be finally swami from um, a quotation from uh, swami consider all your acts as worship duty is god work is worship whatever is happens accept it gladly as his handiwork and as a sign of his compassion so with this uh, i hope that um, we got an essence of uh, uh, swami's teachings uh, in bhagavad gita because um, swami uh who was krishna in the dwapar yuga came as uh, sri sar bhagwan sri sachya sai baba in this kali yuga and since uh, this message in the bhagavad gita already uh, is too compact for us has uh, um, exhorted i mean has uh, amplified this in several of his discourses and has each of these points is amplified and um, told us in several ways so that at least some part of it we can imbibe it om sri sai ram ओम श्री साई राम थैंक यू वेरी मच प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर वी चंद्रशेखर फॉर जेनरसली शेयरिंग योर लर्निंग्स एंड नॉलेज ऑन द रिलेवेंस ऑफ श्रीमद भगवद गीता टू द मॉडर्न सोसाइटी इट इज इंडीड a matter of great honor for me to thank you on the behalf of all the participants on behalf of sri 
Satisai Samyukta Sruti Shreni of the Satisai Seva Organization. To provide an understanding on the deep rooted undercurrent and the apt life source for all times and for all societies, you have started your discussion with a lucid explanation on Sanatana Dharma and its all encompassing nature and approach. Further, to explain this unique inherent feature of Sanatana Dharma, you reminded us on the equal prominence given to the messages and the truth which are eternal and all pervasive as embodied in multiple sources like Shruti, Smriti, Puranas and Itihasa. Sir, to explain the link between Bhagavad Gita and Vedas and its direct message to humanities, you took us to the very background setting and the context in which this celestial song called Bhagavad Gita, which is the quintessence of all Vedas and the milk of Upanishads was recalled. Here you emphasized that Kurukshetra, the battlefield is very really the place in which we are placed in our day-to-day -day life every day. To drive home this point, you have explained the following points. You clearly explained to us that Arjuna's dilemma is indeed everyone's dilemma every day. You have highlighted the importance of action, knowledge on impermanence or transient nature of world is very, very important for us to lead a successful life. You have also explained to us how such an understanding about the impermanence or the transient nature of the world enables one to perform the actions in the right way. Here, you have clearly explained to us the differences between Shreyo Marga and Preyo Marga, Shreyas and Preyas. You have also very clearly cautioned us on the reasons for the downfall. Here you have mentioned that our very thoughts can lead to attachment. This in turn leads to desire, which in turn makes us feel angry. That can lead to bad actions, consequently to the downfall. So you are given a route for the downfall and cautioned us to take care of our thoughts. You have also reminded us about the message from Bhagavad Gita on the pathway to peace. Here you mentioned that sense control can lead to detachment, which in turn can lead to peace. Further, to drive home the important message, you have recalled the divine discourse of Bhagavan Baba with striking examples as given by Swami. Here, you reiterated Bhagwan's message on Ashakti, that is attachment is death and Anasakti, non-attachment is life. Having said all this, you ended your talk with a very neat summary and a set of short goals as follows. To do selfless work, to live in the present, to sublimate 
senses to have feeling or desires these and highlighted and connected them to the message given by bhagwan and also as message from srimad bhagavad gita finally you ended emphasizing the importance of mama dharma that is duty is god work is worship thank you very much sir for sparing your precious time and generously sharing your valuable learnings from simad bhagavad gita with all of us on behalf of all the participants on behalf of sri satyasai samyukta sruti shreni of sri satyasai seva organization we sincerely pray to bhagwan to bless you and your family immensely and to provide you with the energy to carry forward his service forever jai sai ram om jai jagadish hari swami satya sai hari bhakt jana samrakshak bhakt jana samrakshak pati mahishwara om Bye bye